Coming up next, a president who loved his food. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to Garden to Table. Well, I bet you can guess where we are today. This is Monticello, Thomas Jefferson's mountaintop estate. Now, we know Jefferson in lots of different ways. Thomas Jefferson was our third president. He was the author of the Declaration of Independence. But did you know that Thomas Jefferson loved food? In fact, he's considered America's first foodie. In today's show, we'll venture into Jefferson's vegetable garden a 1,000 foot long terrace where he grew 250 varieties and more than 70 different species of vegetables. After that, we'll meet up with Lenny Sorensen. Lenny's a culinary historian, and she talks about the inner workings of Monticello's kitchen. She'll also discuss the fusion of French and Virginian cookery. Plus, a fall heritage festival is underway here at Monticello. We'll talk to event organizers and maybe even swap a few seeds. Well, as you can see, we have a lot to see in today's show. I'm over here on the West Lawn, Let's head over to the vegetable garden just south of here. I want to hook up with my friend Peter Hatch, who's director of Gardens and Grounds. Come on. Well, look at those asparagus beans down there. Yeah, uh, it was another one of Jefferson's fascinations. Uh, he referred to it as a delectable vegetable and passed it out to, uh, to all his friends and neighbors. Uh, I had no idea it. that he grew asparagus beans. That is so cool. Yeah, it was uh, an unusual plant at the time and uh, reflects how, in so many ways, Jefferson was America's first foodie. I, that was, I love that phrase. I mean, he really was. I mean, you look at this vegetable garden and this plot alone or this square, there are five different varieties of very unique things growing. Look at this caracalla bean. Yeah, Jefferson wrote that the caracalla bean um, was the most delicious flowering bean in the world. And I'm not sure he grew it as an edible, but uh, he really aspired to grow it in his garden for its ornamental qualities. Uh, beautiful corkscrew flowers and the amazing fragrance of those flowers. Are, just gorgeous. Are incredible. And, and look at these semblance or, or patty pan squash. Yeah, when Jefferson was in Paris, he uh, uh, asked uh, his friends to send him some simlins or patty pan squashes to show off to his French friends as an example of uh, an American <laughs> vegetable. And he said it was the, um, uh, the most delicious and innocent of all vegetables. He really was proud of being an American, wasn't he? Right, and this was really an American garden in the way he could grow things all year round from all the different parts of the world, including the old world. Right? So Jefferson talked about the esculent plants of Europe, and that included the cool season crops like lettuce that Jefferson would plant uh, around this time of year in September for harvesting throughout the winter months. The microclimate of this garden being great for growing things in the wintertime. You know, his diet really consisted of, of a lot of vegetables, didn't it? Right, he said that uh, he ate meat only as a condiment to his meals while the vegetables constituted the major part. Yeah, and, and what do we have here, Peter? That looks like a little pepper. Yeah, it's a Texas bird pepper. It's a wild pepper that grows in uh, southwestern Texas, and Jefferson was sent seed of this by uh, by an army captain who was stationed in San Antonio, Texas. And again, it was one of his great enthusiasms. He passed it out to a lot of the leading plantsmen in America. And, uh, really? It's sort of the predecessor of our modern race of, uh, of hot and cayenne peppers. <laughs> How interesting. Well, this garden does really represent the fact that he, he, he was America's first foodie. Right, he was first in food and first in gardening and, uh, and even first in wine. And uh, his legacy today, I think, is really proud, profound in the way that um, um, he set a foundation for all the things that we're so interested in today. Lenny, just look at this bounty. It's just gorgeous. Yeah, well, especially at this time of year. It, you're it, looking at the, 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 the last end, the last hurrah of the fall. You know, if you were fortunate enough to, to be a visitor to Monticello when Jefferson was here and were invited to dinner, I mean, it would have been quite an experience. You would have, you would have experienced this fusion of Virginia and, and French uh, foods coming together in some form of fusion. Well, and some people would have been familiar with that style because they came from perhaps urban settings where they would have eaten something like this. But many people who came, this was really a brand new way of eating. It wasn't a whole lot of 
say, meat uh, with just a little bit of vegetables. This was a complicated, beautifully apportioned set meal that had four or six different meat dishes, nicely presented. It had made dishes, as Mary Randolph would have called it, his kinswoman who was the cook, which would have been vegetables and perhaps some kind of sauces or buttered, and then desserts. Every meal, but as well, not just the food, that's important, but the dining style. It's the way of having a small group of people who can all see each other, who talk to each other, who can spend time discussing ideas over uh, beautiful plates of food and then wine. And Now at breakfast they served coffee, tea, uh, and Haisan tea was one of his very favorites, and chocolate, hot chocolate. And so everybody had to have that, the choreography of that coming together every morning um, would have been formidable. Well this kitchen must have been a, 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 just a, a, an anthill of activity. Yes, but a choreographed anthill. It's like, you know, it's I'm the way sure. if, you take, if you take time to really look at an anthill, you can really see that everybody knows where they're going yes. and they're all going someplace. It isn't a, the madness you think it would be. And again, with Edith and Francis, uh, the head cook and the sub cook, and then uh, they're just the outer ring of their really most experienced scullions slash apprentices, and then the outside level. In fact, we know from Ellen that the Peter's muffins, which was a, a recipe that, that Jefferson particularly liked, it's much like an English muffin. It's very fresh, yeasted, has no oil in it. So if you let it sit, it turns into a hockey puck. But if you eat it fresh, <laughs> it's wonderful. And she tells us that uh, they were cooked on the griddle, and then by the time the first batch had arrived and had been served, the second batch would be on its way. So it was uh, loved enough to make a very generous mm. serving of them every day. The timing was everything. Absolutely, and so the choreography run by these extremely skilled women in this kitchen must have been formidable at how they ordered everybody around or uh, made sure that it happened. We know it must have happened because there are no, there are no reports of I went to dinner at Jefferson's and it was horrible. There are only I went to dinner at Jefferson's and it was half French and half mm -hmm. Virginia in good taste and abundance. So uh, clearly Edith Ann and Francis knew what they were doing. Well, and you think about this gorgeous vegetable garden that's a thousand feet long and, and over the course of time over 300 different varieties of fruits and vegetables grown there. Yeah. So you have. Uh, American, something that seems so you know, immensely American. The little patty pan squad Yeah, siblings. he knew them as Simlins, and that's what you see. And certainly in slave gardens, they grew them too, and everybody grew them. And then you have eggplant, eggplant and you have it in, ta da, you have white eggplant, you have purple eggplant, you have the these little ones. fun, are gorgeous. gorgeous things. Lenny, thank you so much for giving us some insight into the history, the fascinating history of, of this aspect of Monticello. In the past, preserving food, having it through the fall and winter and early spring was really at the top of mind. Today, we don't think so much about it because we have, well, refrigerators and freezers and things like that. You know, choosing vegetables like this winter squash that have staying power and that they will last through the winter, hence the name, was one way of preserving food. Here at my farm, we grow lots of different types of squash, certainly the summer squash, but lots of winter squash as well, such as acorn and butternut. Now, one of the reasons these squash last so long is that they're tough. Um, they have a nice thick skin on them, which allows you to store them in a cool, dark place and keep them there for a very long time. But what I find is that they can be tough to cut open. What I like to do is cut horizontally like this. It's just safer using a sharp knife, and then the squash is more manageable to work with. You see like this, I can peel it easier and take out the seed. Now this recipe is really simple. It requires some butternut squash, some apple, and onion. What I'm going to do is take one large butternut squash or a couple of small ones, two apples, a tart apple like a Granny Smith, and one whole onion. And what I've done is I've sliced half of it. I'm gonna slice the other half like this. And then all I'm going to do is layer squash and the apples and the onion all together. 
There's a little bit of squash. Here's the apple. Add some onion in there. Equally distributing it. And I'm just going to take a little more squash and add to the top here. You can see how beautiful this is with all these autumn colors. Now it's time to add the other ingredients before we pop it into the oven. In a bowl, I'm going to combine a half a cup of olive oil and a fourth a cup of apple liqueur and two teaspoons of finely minced garlic. And I also want two teaspoons of finely chopped rosemary. So I'm gonna chop up some of this rosemary that I gathered in the garden. We grow rosemary here both in the ground and in containers. It's not always cold hardy, so I like to move my containers in the greenhouse in the winter and sometimes the ones in the ground actually get through the winter if it's not too severe. You know, there's nothing like having fresh herbs at hand. All right, so there we have it. It's about two teaspoons of rosemary. Put that in there. And then I'm gonna add a little salt and pepper. I'm gonna add a half a teaspoon of pepper, although I like a lot of pepper, and one teaspoon thereabouts of salt. Of course, you can use as much as you like and then I'm gonna whisk this together. The flavor of the rosemary and the apple liqueur really adds a nice touch to this dish. Now when this is all mixed together, you just wanna drizzle it over the top like this. Distributing it evenly. And now it's ready to pop into the oven. I'm just going to take some foil and I'm going to cover the baking dish like this. And I'm going to place it into a preheated oven at 350 for about 30 minutes with the foil on. So here we go. And then I've got one in here to show you. Look at that, isn't that beautiful? Now you want to cook this until the squash is tender, 30 minutes in the oven with the foil on it, and then usually it takes about 15 more minutes with the foil off. It's a beautiful presentation and delicious with so many other things for the fall. What a beautifully grained door. Yes, the doors are faux grain, so they appear to be a finer wood than they really are. Elizabeth, I, this room is incredible. The last time I was here, the dining room was blue. Well, this is Jefferson's chrome yellow dining room. And we discovered this through paint research, and it's been painted yellow since the winter of 2010. Well, it's just, it's extraordinary. You know, these intense colors were really sort of all the rage at the end of the 18th century and beginning of the 19th, weren't they? They absolutely were. Jefferson was really uh, keeping up with fashion by painting this room, this incredibly vibrant color. But think of how it would have looked with candlelight reflected in mirrors. It would have been a beautiful space. Yeah, you know, what an experience to dine in here with this color. Absolutely. This choice of a color cost 33 times the cost of plain white lead paint. Really? It was quite an extravagance. <laughs> a little treat to himself. Well, yeah. And to his, his dinner guests. Amazing. <laughs> well, of course, the centerpiece of this room is this firebox, which is quite amazing. Yes, and the dining room is right over the wine cellar. So in the sides of the fireplace, Jefferson builds sets of trolleys to bring bottles of wine up from ah, below. So on either side, the wine could be brought up, up. into the dining Four room. Four bottles of wine could come up and be ready How to go. interesting. And the firebox itself looks like it's lined with cast iron. Yes, and all the ones in the house are like that. So what you get is you get this depth of a mantle because you have this mechanism on either side, which is the dumb waiter, and then you have the depth of the mm -hmm. firebox mm -hmm. lined in cast iron, mm -hmm. which was really an energy efficient approach. I mean, it was throwing the heat into the room. Jefferson was extremely interested in heating technology and kept up with it throughout his whole life. 
He would be very happy that you noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> now tell me about the chairs and the table that are here in the dining room because this seems like an odd place to have French chairs. Right, well we know that Jefferson liked to sit in front of the fire and read. He never wanted to waste a moment. He would read while waiting for the family to assemble in the room for dinner. Really? Well, why don't we step over into the tea room? I'd love to see what you have set up over here. Now, Elizabeth, we have what here? A, a place setting for dinner? Yes, this is a table set with uh, green shell edge pearlware, which, which would have been sort of your everyday china in the early 19th century. Really? And we know that it was the most common dinnerware used here from doing archaeology outside of the window here. So, so you see shards of it coming up everywhere. Absolutely. So Jefferson had some pieces of Sevres, but the Sevres gets passed down, whereas the everyday china is in the, you know, is in the ground outside. I see. And I mm -hmm. see there's a little bit of mixing and matching going on here, and that's, mm -hmm. that would, be, would have been typical. Absolutely. People would have sort of you know, tried to have a whole matching set, but you would have filled in with extra pieces if you didn't have them. Now, I've noticed yeah. these, um, I guess, dumb waiters mm -hmm. on the sides, these, these small open cabinets mm -hmm. on wheels. Tell me a little bit about those. Jefferson had seen these and enjoyed using them at the informal small dinner parties that he favored in Paris. And they, be, they would have been placed between two chairs of a dinner table. It's a way to dine without having the, the interruptions from, from servants. Now here at Monticello, mealtime and, and entertaining and the food itself was terribly important to Thomas Jefferson, wasn't it? Absolutely. Jefferson was really a real foodie. Uh, he had learned to enjoy good food in Paris. And mealtime was really one of the major events of the day. There was one major meal served between sort of three and four in the afternoon and it would have lasted a couple of hours. Of course, the food that was served here was a, a fusion, I, I guess, of, of American food, colonial food, and, and, and French. French cuisine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, the, and it was grown right here on property. Absolutely, on the plantation. And, and there was a, a, a sort of an ongoing, um, I guess, guest list or guests just showing up. It was not unusual to have as many as 30 people for dinner in one night. This has been so inspiring. Thank you, Elizabeth. Oh, thank you. I don't know about you, but I love the flavor of spinach any time of the year, but we grow a lot of spinach here at the farm, particularly in the fall. Now I wanna show you how easy this recipe is, and it uses sesame oil. And what I'm doing here is I'm taking two tablespoons, actually two teaspoons of sesame oil, and then I'm gonna just take two cloves of minced garlic. And what I'm gonna do is just take that and oil the pan. I've already been heating the skillet. Ooh, it smells really good. That toasted sesame oil is fantastic. And then I'm give this just a minute, and then I'm gonna add 10 ounces of spinach. Now this recipe uh, is enough for two people, so you just need to uh, double it or triple it, however it works for you and what you're trying to do. So I'm gonna go ahead and add the spinach, and as you know, this really cooks down. It looks like a lot of spinach in the beginning, but it really cooks down in a hurry. You know, one of the interesting things about sesame is that um, it's been grown in this country for a long time. It was grown at Monticello by Thomas Jefferson. He had an interest in bringing in new plants into our new country. One of them was sesame. He grew the plants there, had this idea of producing sesame oil. He thought it would make a great product for the United States. Uh, and he actually tried to create an oil press at Monticello. Didn't go very well but he produced the seed and it was used at table at Monticello. You can see just under medium heat, just takes just a minute or two to really take that spinach down. Now I'm gonna add some more ingredients that are gonna really enhance the flavor of this. You're gonna love this dish. Now, it takes a little sugar, not much. Got a half a teaspoon of sugar. I'm just gonna add it now. You distribute it evenly across the spinach. And then I'm gonna add one teaspoon of soy sauce such a nice combination with that toasted sesame oil. And then I've got a little rice vinegar. I've got two teaspoons of rice vinegar just to kind of finish it off here with that. You can see it continues to cook. And then you're gonna to wanna to salt it to taste. And I don't like my spinach cooked uh, completely down. I like some of it still sort of fresh looking. So I'm gonna take just a little bit of salt. 
flavor it. And then I have two tablespoons of toasted sesame seed. And then those go right on top like this. This is really good. It doesn't take long at all and the flavor is sensational. for holding the sweet. Ira, what can visitors expect to, to find when they come to the Heritage Harvest Festival here at Monticello? Oh, there's so much. On the lawn, we have two great big tents, the Master Gardener Root and Shoots tent, where there's all kinds of activities that are kind of family oriented. The tasting tent, where we have- Tasting. Tastings, oh, we're talking fun. tomatoes, peppers, melons, all kinds of artisanal food from our local area. It is the place to get a little taste of the festival. If you're not at the chef's tent, <laughs> so you could, you could have a, a taste of the vegetables <laughs> or you could have it prepared by local chefs. Absolutely, How absolutely. Lovely, yeah. And the heart of the festival is the educational program. We have phenomenal people like yourself who, <laughs> you know, donate their time to uh, help people learn about gardening, learn about food preserving, learn about sustainable agriculture. Uh, there are just so many things and sometimes we have goats, you never know. And oh, the Backyard Revolution, they have all of these kind of old-timey skills, chair making, basket weaving, things like that. And what about seed swap? I've heard all about this seed swap that I'm very excited about. Well, the seed swap is the first thing in the morning. And this year, if you come early, I hear people like you and other legendary seed savers are going to be there for people to meet. Well, I did bring some seed to, to participate, so I'm very excited about it. I can't, I can't wait to see what I bring home to my garden. It looks like a snow-capped mountain in the rocks. Okay. <laughs> What's up? Sure. That's enough to grow. Okay. So you can try it too, right? Uh -huh. Ready right right up now? Yep. Right. French marigolds. So how does this work? You all selling seeds? No, no I get by the way. Swapping. Swapping or giving them away. Have you ever grown American basket flowers? It grows about this tall, has a big purple bloom on it. It comes from the Arkansas River Valley. Let's swap. <laughs> All right. And I have never seen these. Okay. Here. Came from my farm. All right. Oh, I like to yeah. yeah, this is not. This looks like what I'm Yeah, that's what I did. Well, after 200 years, after this 1,000-foot vegetable terrace was created, it's so inspiring to come here and see so many varieties of the foods that Jefferson grew here at Monticello. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Until next time, good eating and good health.